You wouldn't see Katie Price sitting in my field amongst all the cow shedding grass. So you would see a woman like her cultivating stock and cultivating stock and raising a family in the countryside unless she was filming and not be able to show. No. Your pedagogy was shot. You should have the chance. My hash brown tree is running black and your hope is fluttering away like your hope is flittering away like the notes from your wallet. You have run out of stock, my friend. And your pedagogy is shit. You should have spent more time paying attention to eating, silly. If only you thought more of me when I was growing up alongside you. Maybe, maybe I wouldn't have been so hesitant to tell you that you were wrong in the first place. You should have worked hard down at being a good human being, my friend. And then maybe you wouldn't have ended up alone at the top of your tower. I'm looking up you now, and I see your pupils are burning bright. They've been caught in the flash, flash, flash of the city lights. My pupils are fine. I'm a country boy. I'm hiding in the closet with my high heels and fishnets, having a great old time, running around in my Narnia, but as you know, a fucking stone. I'm turning, turning in my metaphorical grave, throwing the roll my eyes at you and in your direction. Your scum, Mr. Eta. Maybe I grew up with page three, but wanking over a fully clothed image of Maggie Thatcher hanging above your bed isn't much better. I'd rather be singing to my potatoes and having a pint in my local than being a poster boy for reckless abandonment. My face is scarred from the claws of a cat that I loved when I was younger, whereas yours is pale and marble. Because you've paid someone to polish over your marble mistakes. I'm speckled and interesting. You are grey and dull. No, you are a grey. You have a thick head of, no, with black hair on it. Because you've paid someone to cover up your roots. You don't age gracefully because you don't age. Maybe I'm stuck in my village doing a job that you think is trivial and boring and manual. Every day, but at least, I wake up in the morning. You don't. I open my eyes and I look out the window and I look around me and I see things. I see people, see people staring at me. I see the frame that contextualises my face for others. I see the gold line now, the states. I will not be moved from my context. But I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that because I am not pretending to be something I am not You move without me and you shuffle your weight. You place your hips directly underneath your shoulders. Then you sway over to your left foot until the ball of your foot hurts. Then you speak to the right. You wiggle your fingers in your pockets, looking for a mobile phone or a loose thread to play with. You get a look, but you are it here. You are it present. I'm addressing you right now, yet all you can think about is who you are in this moment. I'm telling you something, and I'm making it pretty fucking clear. I'm talking to you. You need to open your eyes and pay attention to the moment, because this is the only moment that we've got now, anymore. You can't join me in my field, but you can move your hands out of your pockets and use your fingers to pry open your eyelids. Maybe you can't change who you are, or the role you have in our society, but what you can do 
is take a real look around and see the impact that you have on this world, our world. Maybe we can see past my face and the top of my shoulders and look at what is behind me. Stop focusing on yourself. Stop focusing on my portrait and like because you aren't seeing. You aren't seeing at all. You are just another voter of Big Brother and I will not be your Tavina McCall. Begin with rocking, waves, rocks, rock a bye baby, rock a bye baby, like a bisexual, no, too harsh. Begin with lonely, lonely sleep, sleeping alone, unless I'm naked and you're naked, but we're in a museum so we can't really do that. <laughs> I've just seen that man, that man from that film. He looks like a lot like that man from that film, that one where they are sleeping with a woman. That man from that film, that one where they are sleeping with a woman, the one who's violent, who stubs a fag out on her ear. Quite harsh. Harsh for that man from that film. That film that made me want to sleep naked. Out in that vastness of a pale green and a wood panelled room. Naked and screaming like the day I was born, when I was reborn again. Sleeping beauty. Did it make me feel beautiful? Not when I sleepwalk through life, unseen and unnoticed and uninterested in whatever happens right in front of me. Sleepwalking through life. Asleep in this deep blue depression where waves erode rocks and rocks are never moving. Is this real or just in my sleep? How dangerous this is to sleep, to walk, to go to the kitchen at four in the morning for water that quench, that's woken you, that's brought you gulping down, looking at the gold lights on the street, outside the empty street that leaves nothing but that thought screaming, is this all that's here for me? Is this all that's left here now? Nah, nah. Let's not do that. Let's just sit on this weird box. Sit and think, wakey wakey. Sit and write words which, uh, which, um, which, which get me to the bottom of the page. Peaceful existence, rolling down, face first, hair in my eyes, my mouth, screaming, smack, snap, stop, breathe, breath. I can hear the water, it's, it's delicate yet it feels like it's completely surrounding me, it's cold. I hear a clump, a hoof, a growl and a groan. I feel misguided, mystified, mumbled up and moaning. It smells so much like cow shit. No. I can now see that an easy day is not on the plan for me. I see a doubt. 
am reminded of civilization and the constructs of 21st century living. It smells so much like cow shit. And so I'll sit here, I'll scream. I'll scream for you, for the help, the support, the strength and for the love. I'll remember watching your back as you turned away with shame. Is this the last thing I will know? <coughs> I don't know. I just know that this isn't the place for me to go. Where one stops, the other starts unknown. Unknown of the forced perspective of life that drowns me like the cold water I can hear. The water spewing out of swing mouth. The dump. The bin. The extraction. The clouds look down at me like a disapproving mother. Then the clouds start to cry. I feel the tears touch my face, my mother's tears. I'm suddenly realizing all of my fears. It smells so much like cow shit. Thank you. This was my dad, and all the fucked up facial expressions he ever had. And there were very few of these faces when he was working, before it got bad. Rural and fuel industrialization led to long nights on the couch practicing masturbation. I think all the man needed was a clear head and a vacation, but the depleting dogs decreased his inspiration. All he needed was a woman, love, and sex rather than sun stumbling in upon late night sessions of television X. One pound fifty connection charge, extra fifty p if you use card. One pound a minute and it takes five to get hard. And then what's next? All he needed was a deep sweat. Clammy hands, winds that smell and a relapse back to the internet. Dial up broadband screech always made him go soft. And now that he knew from his cocky colleague that history turns off he could search for. Slut fuck gang bang deep throat golf. <laughs> All he needed was a release. After not too long, he had it. And his stomach felt anything but pride. And that feeling of non pride started to clamber up his side, over his chest, past neck, and down the back of his throat for a ride into his guilty mind. All he needed was someone who would talk and a woman that he didn't need to stalk just so he could bash into her at Tesco and have a conversation about the price of a ham hock his loneliness wasn't always associated with the frustrated flaccidity of his own cock all he needed was a direction and lucky him, the country was rallied in reflection about the dicks in Westminster and if we're getting out what we put in fuck them fuck the government they fucked us up, they fucked my work, they fucked my marriage, they fucked my wife, they fucked my kids, they fucked my dad, they fucked the road, they fucked the NHS, they fucked the mines, they fucked our secrecy, they fucked the poor, and they fucked me. Vote oh, yes! All we needed was the internet to, to continue to vent stress, but this time it wasn't watching Sasha Grey give head and undress that helped him sleep at night. Knowledge was his pillow and a blanket, and campaigning in the street left him less inclined to wank it seven, eight, nine or twelve things a day. Maybe he'd become asexual or, or gay. He gained a better relationship and the yes badge from the son. And it wasn't that badge that acted as a signifier to the one that he met in Tesco, blissfully aware right next to him, the, hand, the ham hock. When he spoke, there was no focus on his cock. Just that chat which was inspired by the change in a nation that he wanted to see. And as he looked into her eyes, he could see that they wanted to be together. On the 18th of September, holding hands no matter what the weather, all he needed was her. And he had her. And the outcome was together. That was my dad. Thank you.
It reminds me that some of them are the same. Hmm? Before I begin, it feels like I need to warn you, or some of you, it's only fair to warn you before I start. So those of you who have ever been in a church, or in any kind of religious buildings, those of you who have been to a wedding or a funeral, or know of people who have been to a wedding or a funeral, those of you who think there's a possibility for something greater than yourself, or that there's no possibility for that and you are the greatest of all, or even if you're sometimes in doubt about anything really, or if any of you have ever witnessed anyone in doubt, or if sometimes you just think that, you, you know, you're not sure, or when you, if you ever sat on a bench, if you sometimes feel like people walk past as you sit on a bench, that's not quite big for two people, but too big for one. If you listen to music, or if you like singing, if you draw your experiences from those and that around you, if any of this rings a bell, I mean, if any of this is descriptive of you, or, or you at some point thought, ah, oh, yeah, I'm like that, or, or he or she is like that, that I know is that like, or, then I would like to kindly ask you to stay. This will be okay for you. But those of you who have never been in a museum, I would kindly like to ask you to leave, please. Good. You are all aware of your surroundings. Very good. So I would first want to apologize for the setting and apologize for the music and these small benches. I'm sorry you have to sit there and stand there. Uh, this isn't really ideal, is it? So this is an altar piece of the Virgin Mary with Jesus as a baby. I say virgin because she just had a baby. Um, so if you don't believe me, you can read 
this a beautiful altar piece of the, the, the Virgin Mary that she's a baby with the folks for prayer and meditation. Okay, so this is Jesus' penis over here, and I'd like to draw your attention to it. If you find this inappropriate, I would like to remind you that this is not a church or a chapel, this is a museum pretending to be a church or a chapel. Like a mini chapel, like you know the ones in Las Vegas. But we're not in Las Vegas. So I was, yeah, Jesus' penis. Um, this, um, um, if I'm, yeah, if I'm thrown out for talking about it, this is a part of this introduction. So it's just to keep you engaged and slightly nervous. So if, whilst I'm holding my hand and pointing at it, if somebody comes in and tells me not to do it, just close your eyes and cover your ears and pretend they're not here. And if you could just cover your ears, that would be great. Like if they come, no, if they come. And if you open your eyes and I'm not here anymore and you won't see me pointing or at, for the rest of the day, that will be the end of this introduction. And um, we have rehearsed that. So don't worry if anyone tells you that this wasn't rehearsed or that this wasn't accepted. Um, yes. So I'm just gonna continue talking about his penis. So I was going to um, tell you a story about a dog. I was going to tell you a story about a dog that um, uh, a dog, that, his name is Jackson, so there's a dog Jackson, and he um, lived in a farm. He lived in a farm, a really, really, really nice farm, um, and he had, he had like owners. So he had a man and a woman who cared for him, and they, names were um, Johnny and June, and they had Jackson, um, and there was a really, really big forest by the farm, and uh, where the dog lived, and there was a really sunny, sunny land, and they had all kinds of um, plants and grass and fields, fields and fields and fields of trees and valleys, and it was really, really nice. And uh, one really hot summer day, Jackson goes, runs into the woods, and um, he's playing, he's like trying to bite his tail or, or whatever dogs do in fields. And he's running around, and and then suddenly the forest is caught on fire, and there's a forest fire, and um, Jackson runs away from the forest and into the sunlight, and he tries to tell his owners about the forest fires, and that they are they are outside just enjoying the sun, and June is sunbathing, she's getting her tanned on as he gets a sunstroke, and. And later on that day, when when the the forest has burnt down and, and the farm has burnt down, and Jackson is dead in the field because of the fire, um, and June has a really nice tan on, and Johnny turns to June and tells her that there's no lightness without darkness, because because June has really nice tan. And it was a nice day, but they don't have a house anymore, or a dog, or a forest. I was going to tell you that story, but but then I just I just found it really inappropriate to talk about a dying dog in 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 this kind of setting. Um, so I guess Jesus's penis just took all my attention, and I would like to apologize for that. Uh, this wasn't my intention at all. I wasn't gonna. I wasn't gonna sp speak about his penis because it's really inappropriate. Um, it's inappropriate that I'm holding my hand up and like pointing at it. I'm quite close, and I'm getting kind of tired of holding my hand like that. So I'm happy you're all still here. And the man, the man that I had planned to come in to take me out didn't come. Um, so I'm just gonna leave. And if you want to come and take a closer look at it, you can. You can just come up one by one and take a good look at it if you like. But you don't have to, it's truly up to you. Today I'm 
going to be talking a little bit about an expected artist. And by that, I mean those who started out their career thinking they would be a plumber, or an electrician, or an accordion player, or a sports personality. actually ended up being remembered for the artwork. This piece will be a lot about memory. And how we like ourselves and our own lifestyles and our own places of worship and our homes to be credited or not credited and passed on. So this piece is by a man named John Kenachi. He was an accidental or unexpected artist. Before he knew it, he was even further. He had given birth to art, namely sculpture and metalwork. Although not always metalwork, sometimes he would make work with plywood, sand, found objects, glass bottles, television sets, radios, stones. Stones from the beach, stones from the mountains, stones from the seabed, where he could dive off his boat and fumble around. Breath held and eyes closed until he could feel a stone he liked. A good one. He was so committed to his art without even knowing what he was doing. And I find that just exceptional. So with the stones of various sizes and various colours and various origins, he began to balance them on top of each other and create towers and forts and nests Eventually, he started working with metal. And he would ask for really long reels of metal wire that he brought to where he was working. At the time, which was this really remote island between Orkney and Shetland, the island was called Morven. to support the structures he had built from stone. He would link them together so it wasn't as easy for them to topple over. He really loved the aesthetic of the metal wire. So in his cottage on the island, he actually used some of the metal wire to decorate He covered an entire wall of metal strings, one right next to the other, all along the wall. That cottage is still there today, still as it was when he lived there. It exists as a visitor center, and they provide maps to where you can find the works of his that are still standing. So anyway, he would, first of all, metal wires to support the stones and structures, but he realised that the reason he loved this aesthetic was because he found security in it. It was easy support. He could just order it in and it would do the job. But actually, that was not his own experience of what support was. So he started to use hay from the stable where his horse was kept. He would graze bits of these straw together and use them as sort of strings. Later in his work, he moved to making a string out of horses here, and then cumin here. So these structures became embedded in the aisle. 
and she would leave them in openly windy places in the island. And I mean, some of them were quite big. His biggest work was about five times the size of this one. So I mentioned earlier that Kenichi was an unexpected artist. And that was because, obviously, when he was making his art, it wasn't intentionally made to be art. He actually came to Morgan because he felt a very empty homelessness, hopelessness in the place he was born in. He felt that there was nowhere he could be alone to himself. So he felt a sense of not actually being there. He describes it in his autobiography as a depth of longing for oneself so frightening all of my organs and left them slowly deflating and crying and screaming while the rest of the world, world sauntered by. So in this, Kenichi began a search for himself, but soon this proved futile. His search for higher re meaning or reason to be himself or reason to be at all, he became fascinated or some would say obsessed with stone circles and other ancient places of worship in Scotland. And he spent, spent days and weeks in libraries and museums, reading books, copying word from word the text, and drawing from his imagination what he thought these beautiful structures must look like. And then he came across one book which held his answer. A remote island between Orkney and Shetland called Morven. It was the only island in Scotland to know one of these structures. He sought to go to this place and find connection with God, to bring fate to his life by structuring worship. Using the land to praise, praise the watcher, the creator, or simple, the, simply the sky. So he went, spent 12 years on this island. Towards year 10, people started to write articles about the goings on in Morgan. They would spend hundreds of pounds on tickets to see the structures, touch them, or dance with them. or in some other way try to connect to Kenichi's God. But, and this is the end of the story, one camera crew flew over the island and realised that actually, from above, the statues take the form of a giant cock. Kenichi had completely unaware that he had become the unexpected father of what would be criticised as a cock island. Created mockery amongst the sacred landscape. So Kenichi, devastated by this revelation, and losing faith in the power that he thought had saved him, decided to drown himself in the waters of Morgan. He took down to the rock hills one night and drowned just as the sun was fading and let himself fall to the sea. Fortunately for us, Kenichi didn't actually die that day. But woke up on the shore believing he had just seen the face of God. And so he created this last work, The Face of God by John Kenichi. Before his death, some years ago. Hades. This is where the moon began. One by one, 
to sit and stare at the pure and traditional landscape beyond the reach of the sit and slopes. We are neither out of the slopes of the roads nor at the pure energy of the untouched rock milk guarded by tempestuous waters for us to occupy a drum that's into life. A steady slow beat between the worlds, emanating from their blue and grey threads, falling into line, decreasing and increasing in volume. The moon soon will raise light with it. We are unique in the time we live in, but not in the actions we take. We've made all of our decisions before, and we will do again. Feel it here, now, yesterday, and tomorrow. The remnants of our past and the flickers of our future litter the pages of a predetermined history. Layers and layers of our memories and blood lie in the earth which we walk upon. All of this has happened before and all of it will happen again. Not in these millennia, not in 100 millennia, but in time we will reset and begin once more. The touch of a hand, a pattern of conversation, the inexplicable feeling that the first time we've done something has actually been completed before. The same choices, coincidences and mistakes repeated and repeated, pierced on occasion with flashes of what has gone. What we think is a present reality switched to the feeling the memory in the space of a millisecond, what our generations have labelled as déjà vu. Human spirit is mistaken for strength of life. All which dies will rise again, and all that rises will survive. No twist of fate, no destiny, no all-seeing, all-knowing power. Just the detailed configuration of steps that our lives have been tuned to. A pattern coordinated in a realm transcending science, religion, and even sentience. All of this has happened before and all of it will happen again, here, now, yesterday, and tomorrow. I'm not the first chat nurse. 